is a good one today. Today, we talk about how complaining physically rewires your brain and more importantly, what to do about it. Nothing more I need to say. That and more coming up next on The Virtual Couch. Hey, everybody, I'll make this one quick. Now, as a therapist myself, of course, I recommend that everybody give therapy a try. Truly, we're all hanging on to some things that would be helpful to process, or there's things in our life that we might, uh, maybe we thought we'd achieve by now, or there's things that we desperately want to achieve so that we won't live a life full of regrets. Or there are people listening right now who may be noticing that their anxiety or their depression is getting a tiny bit more, uh, let's call it amplified, the longer that it's left untreated. You owe it to yourself or those around you, to your spouse, your kids, and actually, I guess, really the most important person is you to at the very least give therapy a try. So if you're nervous about finding the right fit, if you're worried about bumping into somebody in a therapy waiting room, if you have any worries about therapy, might I recommend that you go immediately to betterhelp.com slash virtual couch. Again, that's betterhelp.com slash virtual couch, all one word, and take a look at the world of online therapy. Go check out what over 500,000 people have already done before you and uh, sign up right now. Go to betterhelp.com slash virtual couch. You'll get the help that you need. You'll get 10% off your first month services. They have a broad range of expertise and their counselor network network, which might not be locally available in many areas. The service is available wherever you live. It's worldwide and you can log into your account at any time and send a message to your counselor. You can get a timely and thoughtful response. Plus you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions. So you don't ever have to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room as with traditional therapy. Although I maintain that my waiting room is very nice and comfortable. Betterhelp.com will assess your needs, match you with your own licensed professional therapist. And they have therapists that, that specialize in everything, all kinds of things, OCD, anxiety, depression. They use modalities such as acceptance and commitment therapy, my favorite, and you can start communicating typically in under 24 hours. They're committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches so they make it easy and free to change counselors if needed. Nothing awkward about that whatsoever. So uh, if you do go through betterhelp.com slash virtual couch, again, you'll receive 10% off your first month services. So what are you waiting for? You owe it to yourself. And at the very least, just go check it out. Go ahead, pause the podcast right now. Go do it. I'm not going anywhere. Um, Now let's get to the show. episode 176 of The Virtual Couch. I'm your host, Tony Overbay. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, certified mindful advocate, coach, writer, speaker, husband, father of four, ultra marathon runner, and co-author of the best-selling book, He's a Porn Addict. Now what? An expert and a former addict to answer your questions, in which I play the role of the expert and creator of The Path Back, an online pornography recovery program that is helping people like you reclaim their lives from the harmful effects of pornography. If you or anybody that you know is struggling to put pornography behind them once and for all, and trust me, it can be done in a strength-based, hold the shame, become the person you always knew you could be way, then please head over to pathbackrecovery.com, and there you can download a short ebook that describes five common mistakes that people make when trying to get rid of pornography once and for all. Again, that's pathbackrecovery.com, and please stop by Virtual Couch on Instagram, doing some questions and answers, a little Instagram TV, and uh, so I'd appreciate it if you follow along there, and you can find the Virtual Couch page on Facebook. That is still relatively new previously, and uh, still actually doing most of the pointing, at some point, I guess I should probably switch this over when I'm promoting the Virtual Couch page on Facebook. But the Tony Overbay Licensed Marriage and Family Therapist page is uh, is there as well. Why not uh, go like them both? And if you have a minute and you've enjoyed any of the Virtual Couch podcast material, please do me a favor and rate and review and subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcast. That goes a long way for getting the podcast in front of people. And I've been neglecting to say the last couple episodes, if you if you can stop by TonyOverbay.com and just uh, take a moment, sign up for my email newsletter. There's a whole lot of things coming up that I cannot wait to share with you. And Salt Lake City, I've been talking about this the last couple of weeks. I'm going to be speaking at the Outlier Podcast Festival on Saturday, January 25th. And uh, the podcast festival is actually Friday the 24th and Saturday the 25th. And I'm, I'm super excited about this opportunity because I'm talking about a subject that I am far too familiar with. It is the dreaded imposter syndrome and how truly living and podcasting from your values is absolutely necessary in order to just basically live a far more authentic, empowered life, all those good buzzwords. But especially if you're creating a podcast, people that are trying to just um, talk about things that uh, they don't necessarily feel a passion about. I think that's a big part of why they are now pushing 900,000 podcasts and uh, a lot of them start to fizzle out after a few episodes. So you can find out more there at Outlier Podfest, outlierpodfest.com. And I'm going to put that in the show notes as well. And you can lose, uh, you can lose, you can lose, but I suggest you find the code outlier 
if you're interested in attending the podcast festival and you get 15% off of your ticket. And uh, very quickly, too, thanks to everybody who reached out and asked about um, me speaking in Salt Lake City on Sunday evening, the 26th. I received uh, just a bunch of wonderful people who asked if I might be able to come and speak to their congregations or do uh, various firesides, and it was flattering and humbling. And I did get a chance to nail down a time, a location, a topic. So if you are anywhere near Salt Lake City on Sunday, January 26th, I'll be speaking at 7 p.m. Um, in the Midvale North Stake. That's a building that's located on 97th West and 7500 South in Midvale, Utah. And uh, I'll post some things about that on, on those social media things I mentioned earlier. And the message is titled, Hang In There. You're doing better than you think. It's one of the, my, I don't know, I'm excited to present this topic. And I promise you it'll be an upbeat message. And my goal is that you leave there just truly feeling hope, um, feeling empowered about your life, about moving forward with whatever challenges you might be feeling right now, just anything. So again, that's uh, Sunday evening, January 26th at 7 p.m. in Midvale. All right, today's topic is a good one, and it's one that I also hope will leave you feeling a bit more hopeful, a bit more upbeat, because remember, there is no shame in my dojo, because there's really nothing helpful about it, and uh, if you've listened to any of the Virtual Couch podcasts, I hope that's one of the messages that you're you're getting. In now pushing 15 years of doing therapy, I've still yet to make a case for somebody shaming themselves, kind of beating the crud out of themselves, and then having that turn out to be a good thing. You know, there's, and I, and I know that a lot of times we feel like we have to really get down on ourselves and beat ourselves up for change. And, uh, but I think that's a big reason why we keep struggling with some of the things that we struggle with. So I'm going to refer to, or I guess react as the kids say these days to a recent article that was getting shared a lot on social media called how complaining physically rewires your brain to be anxious and depressed. And uh, along the way, I want to plug in some good old acceptance and commitment therapy, which again is my therapy model of choice to help us make the most of the data that we're about to read. And again, the article is called How Complaining Physically Rewires Your Brain to Be Anxious and Depressed. And uh, I will confidently say they throughout this podcast instead of forgetting or butchering someone's name because the post comes simply as a Daily Health Post editorial from uh, it was a little bit earlier on in 2019 but again it was getting shared a whole lot recently i've been seeing it on my social media feeds so they will refer to the daily health post uh, editorial staff so how complaining physically rewires your brain to be anxious and depressed kind of interesting topic because there are a lot of us that kind of at times maybe do feel a need to complain or you know and I, and i think that the article does a nice job starting out by talking about what's your nature there there are a few different archetypes of negativity So they start by saying, we all know a Debbie Downer who's perpetually negative and tends to bring everybody down with them. And for these people, life is always against them and they can never seem to catch a break. And they eventually find themselves uh, oftentimes alone because their negativity can be physically exhausting to be around. And and again, I, I think that we all know these types, maybe when they come walking up. That uh, and and uh, you know they're wonderful people. You might even be one of these people if you just feel like everything seems like it's kind of a slog. Everything seems like the world is against you. And the problem is now. Here, let me throw my marriage and family therapist hat on. We also all want to be heard. I mean, that's one of the key components of marriage therapy. That's what our kids want. That's what we want in our jobs. That we 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 in essence want to be heard, and we don't really want to just hear everybody tell us. Yeah, but look at it this way. Or, okay, but have you thought about this? Because the truth is, when somebody, even if they are chronically negative, so to speak, they, that's part of the frustrating thing is that they, they have tried to just be positive or they have tried to just change their thoughts to be happy. And when that doesn't work, that leaves them typically feeling like, what is wrong with me? So, so again, everybody complains once in a while. And uh, as the article says, especially in our overly negative society. And for the most part, Dr. Robin Kowalski, a professor of psychology at Clemson University, insists that complaining is perfectly normal. The article then goes on to talk about these archetypes of negativity. So they say, not everybody with a negative state of mind experiences and expresses the worldview in the same way. Just like every other personality trait, pessimism has its variations. So they say, here are the three most common types of complainers. See if you, uh, if you fit into any one of these. Venters. Venters are people who just want to be listened to. They typically look for someone to listen to their complaints, but are quick to shut down solutions, even when it's good advice. That second part might ring a bell if you are someone who is uh, around often in a relationship or has a family member who is just a venter. And, And I have to tell you, I love as a therapist, nothing more than when people do come in at times and just say, okay, you know, they might have a list written down or they, you know, I still remember one person who would often say, okay, I'm just going to dump. I'm just going to give me about 15 minutes on the clock and I am just going to unload and dump. 
and then and then they then they say okay once that's gone then we can start to talk so the venter the venter are the people that just want to just get something off of their mind a lot of times they've just been carrying around so much in their head and uh, they just need somebody to listen to them and and so as a therapist or uh, you know i think that this is key as a parent or as a partner or anybody who interacts with a lot of people oftentimes our job is truly just to listen and and often we feel like we need to fix i mean not even just the the stereotypical or classic guy example of you know men have a fix it brain but oftentimes when we don't feel like we know what to do sometimes just saying man tell me more that must be hard or that really stinks often doesn't feel like we're doing enough so even the person who's listening or is the target of the venting even if that is their job you know if they are uh, if their friend comes to them and says, I just need to vent, I need somebody to just listen to me and not say a word, it's still very, very hard for us to just listen, even just listen with empathy and not say anything, or or even to give those kind of phrases like, wow, what was that like? Or that really must be difficult. Although the reality is, that is exactly what we need. That's often what we need. If we want to get into this world of uh, of good old functional brain scans, and I can't wait for a day where we can you know, have a brain scan capability um, in the beanie that I'm wearing as I give this podcast or in a a baseball hat or, you know, uh, that somebody can come into a therapist office and while we're talking, I can just say, hey, throw on the brain scan helmet for uh, while we're talking here. Because here's what happens. When we feel heard, the, the nice little synapses of the brain open up. I mean, we start to, you can see parts of the brain literally light up. Even if we're complaining or venting to someone that we feel is safe and a trusted friend, if they start to say, well, well, had you kind of really thought about it this way, you know, what happens? We immediately kind of go on the defense, even if we're not aware that we're doing that. And again, get this functional brain scan going. And when we are venting, when we're trying to open up, when we're trying to be heard, even if someone means well and they're telling us that maybe it isn't as big of a deal as we think it is, or haven't we thought about this solution or that solution, that's where you can watch the brain start to shut down. Because what is happening? You're starting to go into a little bit of fight or flight mode. I know it sounds overly dramatic, but, but, you know, in reality, when we're not heard, then what our brain is doing is, well, wait a minute, you know, they're, they're not, wait, I, I said that, no, well, I have thought about that, or you don't think I've tried that, or, you know, well, forget it, you know, you're not listening to me anyway. So when those things are happening in conversation, the person that is doing the venting starts to get a little defensive. When we start to get a little defensive, our heart rate starts to raise up a little bit. When our heart rate raises a little bit, a little bit of stress hormone, a little bit of cortisol starts to flood the brain. When that happens, our brain goes, oh, battle, we've we got a saber-toothed tiger around the corner. So it's time to go into fight, flight, or freeze mode. So if you just look at it from that standpoint, isn't it kind of easy to see why conversations can go south? Even when we mean them well, if our teenage child comes to us or if our spouse comes to us and just wants to vent and unload, and even if we mean well and say, hey, you know, you're better than that. You don't even need to worry about that anymore, that the person truly doesn't feel heard. So uh, I think that there's tangent number one of the day. Um, This article is simply saying, here we go, venters, right? So they typically look for someone to listen to their complaints, but they're quick to shut down solutions, even when it's good advice. And I think that that, the little tangent I went on kind of addresses that, uh, why they are quick to shut down solutions, even when it's good advice, because these people, venters, they just want to be heard. They just want to be listened to. So what do you do? You listen, and you learn nice, empathetic phrases again, like, tell me more. That must be hard. What was that like? What's, what's, what's been your situation or what's been the case when you've done that before? Um, what did, uh, you know, what did they say next? Or it, so somebody wants you to just kind of be there with them along for the ride. The second part, uh, the second, um, archetype of negativity, he calls sympathy seekers. He says, everybody's come across one of these before too. These kinds of complainers are, they, they always one up your misery. They always, always have it worse than you and are quick to see the fault in situations and others. And that, that one's pretty fascinating. That one to me, and I can honestly remember the person where this one hit me the most. This person where um, a, a friend had said, hey, this person's kind of a, a one-upper with their, uh, with their tales of woe. And I remember thinking, I, I've never really noticed that. And then sure enough, you know, if you share that, hey, here's something that's happening that's frustrating for me or something that's, uh, that I'm struggling with or a challenge I'm going through. And, you know, you know this person, the sympathy seeker. So they're like, oh, man. Tell me about it. This is my situation, and it's way worse, you know. So basically, uh, you you are left feeling like, okay, I can't say anything else because this person's just going to shut me down, or they've always got a, a story that is more intense, or more sad, or more horrific, or you know, it's almost like you want to say, fine, you know, you win, you uh, you win the sympathy seeking competition. So so we've all come across those types of people too. The third archetype of negativity that he talks about is chronic complainers. So these kind of complainers, um, they say, do something researchers call ruminating, which means to obsessively think and complain about a problem. 
Instead of feeling relaxed after complaining, they actually become worried and anxious from the act. And so ruminating is something that's pretty fascinating. And the reason I, I, uh, I want to talk about ruminating for a second is if I go back to the, the podcast I did a couple of weeks ago on the book, A Liberated Mind, which is my very favorite acceptance and commitment therapy book right now. There's a little, there's a little uh, uh, thing that uh, Dr. Stephen Hayes, who's one of the founders of Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, the founder of Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, talks about in this book. He's given the six principles of Acceptance and Commitment Therapy. And when he's talking about number four, he talks about presence. So follow with me here. Presence. He says it requires pivoting from rigid attention driven by the past, so we're going to get to that, and the future to flexible attention in the now. And this concept redirects the yearning for orientation. What does that mean? Dr. Hayes says processes of rigid attention show up as ruminating, there's that word, about the past, or worrying about the future, or mindlessly disappearing into our current experience the way teenagers disappear into video games. As we struggle with life's challenges, Dr. Hayes says we often, be- but we often fear becoming lost, and we tend to look to the past and the future to become oriented. And I love that concept, that our brain, again, our brain, bless us, squishy pink heart is always trying to do us a solid. Our brain thinks by looking to the past or looking to the future that we're going to be oriented. But instead, we find ourselves in a mental fog of what was or what will be when there really is only what is. I used to would have, I can't, you know, in the past, I would have said, I can't believe I just made that comment, you know, said that statement that really what is, is. But I really believe it. So if you think about that, of our brain is trying to become oriented. It's trying to say, yeah, but in the past I did this. So in the world of acceptance and commitment therapy, what we say to when our brain says, okay, but in the past, this is what you did. Then you say, noted. Yeah, you, you bet I did. Thank you, brain. Thank you for that reminder. Uh, might not be the most um, productive thought right now. Not even arguing with that with you. I probably did do that. Maybe I'm quite sure I did that. Maybe I didn't really do that. And you're... Uh, and you're kind of making things worse. But, uh, but again, thank you, brain. I will note that and I will continue to move on. Or if we're, if we're worrying about the future, you know, the, the future says, okay, but what if this happens? Again, we need to stop and say, thank you, brain. I appreciate the warning, but, uh, you know, maybe that won't happen either. So both of those things, ruminating about the past, worrying about the future, take us away from all we can kind of control, which is what is right now, the present. So Dr. Hayes in this, uh, in this concept of presence says flexible attention in the now or being present means choosing to pay attention to experiences here and now that are helpful or meaningful. And if they're not, then choosing to move on to other useful events in the now rather than being caught in mindless attraction or revulsion. So if you have found yourself as one of these three types of uh, archetypes of negativity right now, no guilt. No shame. We're just trying to say noted. There's something that uh, we need to take a look at. Are we venters? Are we sympathy seekers? Are we chronic complainers? Okay, let me uh, take a quick break to talk about my podcast host, Blueberry, and then we're going to get right back to how negativity rewires the brain. Attention all future and current podcasters. I want to take a minute and talk to you about Blueberry Podcasting. If you are currently hosting your podcast elsewhere, or even if you're thinking about starting up your own podcast, and I know that there's a good chance that you really are. True story. I get a few emails every week from people who want to start their own podcast. and They're looking for some advice, um, what equipment to buy, what recording software to use, and what do you even do once you have your podcast recorded? And that is where Blueberry Podcasting comes into play. Blueberry Podcasting has been in business since 2005, and they are one of the most trusted names in the podcasting space. They were the first to be IAB certified, which trust me, as literally thousands of podcasts come online on a daily basis. Seriously, there are currently over 800,000 podcasts on the market and growing daily. That IAB certification is a very big deal, and they offer five-day phone support with real live people, the only podcast company that actually offers phone support, and they have email support available every day of the week. And if you're currently hosting your podcast elsewhere, and I can honestly say I used two other hosting companies before Blueberry, but the larger the virtual couch got, the more I realized I needed all of Blueberry's advanced features. Let me go through a few of those. Like, Blueberry customers can always replace an episode that's been published with one that has new edits at no charge. This is something I'm slowly doing as I go back and I re-edit and add things that I wasn't even aware of early on in my podcasting career. 
Blueberry Podcasting Services work on any publishing platform, and Blueberry Podcasting is fully integrated into WordPress. This is a big deal. They have a PowerPress plugin for those who are already using WordPress, and it makes uploading and promoting your episodes a piece of cake. But you don't even need to be a WordPress uh, user to launch your podcast with Blueberry Podcasting. They provide every hosting customer a basic WordPress site if you need one. So you got that website that goes along with your podcast. So the Blueberry way of podcasting is where you own your brand, your IP, and you control the podcast feed. That's the reason why Blueberry podcasters have the longest lived shows in the podcasting space. Over 80,000 shows are taking advantage of Blueberry's podcasting services. All Blueberry hosting plans include 25% no-fault overage for storage allowances, which is a big deal. And all independent podcast hosts receive unlimited bandwidth on each of their flat rate plans. Blueberry has a pro hosting option for commercial shows, and it has an incredible offering of basic ad injection, which is something that I've been taking advantage of again for the virtual couch and is one of the main reasons why I switched over to Blueberry Podcasting to begin with. If you need editing services, BlueberryPro.com can help, or they have independent partners that are there for you as well. Blueberry Podcasting is the designed to scale as you grow from whether it's one to 500 shows on the same platform. So right now you can get 30 days of Blueberry podcasting free. It includes hosting and stats and a WordPress website if you need one. Publishing is as simple as create and upload. So what are you waiting for? You will find a link in the show notes on this very episode, or you can go to blueberry.com and it's spelled B-L-U-B-R-R-Y.com and use the code B-L-U-014 to get 30 days of Blueberry podcasting for free. Again, just head to the show notes of this virtual couch episode or just go to B-L-U-B-R-R-Y.com, sign up and use code B-L-U-014 to get 30 days of Blueberry podcasting for free. I can't wait to see you out there on the podcasting interwebs. Okay, and we're back. All right. When we last left, we were talking about the three archetypes of negativity, venters, sympathy seekers, chronic complainers. So now let's get into a part of the article that talks about negativity and how it can rewire your brain. So they say negativity is a downward spiral, meaning that the more you focus on problems instead of solutions, you eventually start to see the negative sides of everything in your life. While bouts of negative thinking happen off and on, it's important to let yourself vent, but quickly move on to solutions. And, uh, and they say it's really worth doing. For one, negativity physically destroys our brain. People who routinely experience chronic stress, particularly acute, even traumatic stress, release the hormone cortisol, which I had mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, cortisol, they say, which literally eats away, almost like an acid bath at the hippocampus, which is a part of the brain that's very engaged in visual spatial memory, as well as memory for context and setting, it explains Rick Hansen, PhD, a psychologist and senior fellow of the Great Good Science Center at UC Berkeley. Plus, negative thinking reinforces neuropathways associated with that emotion, eventually making it an automatic reaction. That same can be said of any repetitive thought or action. And so let's kind of talk about these two paragraphs that, uh, that I just talked about. The first one is that concept of, of cortisol um, acting almost like an acid bath of the hippocampus, which is part of the brain that's engaged in visual spatial memory, as well as memory for context and setting. So I don't want that to sound like this. Oh my gosh, I'm, every time I think a negative thought, you know, there's this uh, dramatic acid bath that's going to eventually leave me in some uh, zombie-like state. That's not the case. But the, the theory there, the, not even the theory, the science shows that the negativity, which then, you know, causes us to go into a little more of this fight or flight response, then which that fight or flight response is a, a derivative of this cortisol, this hor- hormone cortisol, which is being released in the brain. So, again, we're going to have the thoughts, feelings, emotions that we have because we're human. And one of the key principles of acceptance and commitment therapy that I love, and I, I love whenever I can even go on this little tangent, is that. Hey, you have those thoughts, emotions, and feelings you have because you are the only person on the face of the earth that has gone through all the things you've gone through. Uh, Nature, nurture, birth order, DNA, abandonment, rejection, uh, hopes, dreams, fear, all of those things make you who you are. So that is why you have the feelings or the thoughts or the emotions, even the anxious thoughts, even the anxious feelings, even the fear or the worry or the ruminating or the future telling. Those all happen because, again, you're the only person that's gone through what you've gone through. So your brain is really trying to protect you. It is worried for you because your brain actually thinks that its job is to have you live forever. And I think that's an important concept that I learned at a training long ago is that your brain wants to to use the least amount of electrical activity humanly possible. And so when things get moved into this uh, habit center, the habit center is this uh, little part of the brain called the basal ganglia. 
this little walnut sized part of the brain. And uh, whenever I like to talk about this, I love the fun fact that I remember the first training I went to on basal ganglia, or it might have even been the book that I, uh, uh, Power of Habit, Charles Duhigg, where the talk of the basal ganglia, the concept was that things like fish and squirrels, their brain is nothing but basal ganglia. It's just this reactive brain. We have lots of gray matter. We have this, uh, you know, we have these connective uh, left to right brain, the corpus callosum. We have all of this wonderful stuff of the brain that uh, that allows us to have these advanced thoughts and abilities and emotions and that sort of thing. So we are more than our basal ganglia, but at the core, kind of almost literally, of the brain is this basal ganglia, this habit center. So even when you think of when you learn how to tie a shoe or back out of your driveway, your brain throws that activity into this basal ganglia. When your brain has to pull from the basal ganglia, it doesn't need a whole lot of electrical activity to do that. So doesn't it make sense that your brain wants to put everything it can, it wants to create as many habitual patterns as it can because it thinks that that is doing you a favor, that it will live forever or longer or, or whatever it's thinking at the time. But now look at that when we have these negative patterns of behavior, or we have these negative thought processes those two eventually get filed into the basal ganglia. Now, there is nothing to say that that means that, oh, well, we're doomed. But what that says is that the quicker we can kind of make note of those things, where we can then kind of work away from those things, where we can kind of channel our thoughts in different directions, or we can channel our behaviors in different directions, the more that we're going to create these new neuropathways, these new habits that, that we can also file into that basal ganglia as well. So that's how when, when in this article... Um, this Rick Hansen, PhD psychologist and senior fellow of the Greater Good Science Center at UC Berkeley, uh, talks about negative thinking reinforces these neuropathways associated with that emotion, eventually making it an automatic reaction. There's that basal ganglia. So the same can be said with any repetitive thought or action, again, positive or negative. So we want to be able to recognize these negative thoughts, not beat ourselves up about them. Note them. There you are, brain. I get why you're, why you're thinking that. I get why you're ruminating about the past because you're worried about me. And I get why you're trying to look ahead in the future because you're worried about me. But it kind of takes me away from this present moment. So, so they say, however, this also allows you to change your brain. You can train your brain to do pretty much anything, even when it comes to your outlook. The more you work hard to find the positivity in every situation, the more it can become automatic. But I do not want you to think that if you cannot just change your thoughts to positive, that something is wrong with you. And I've done a couple of episodes on this. This is something that comes into my office, I can almost say on a daily basis, where people are hearing a lot of wonderful people out on the internet, a lot of wonderful podcasts where people just say, you just got to wake up in the morning and say, I am thinking positive thoughts. I've just got to go for it. And I am going to think all positive thoughts today. And then the second that a negative thought creeps into your brain, because guess what? It, it'll, it'll happen. Your brain can do whatever it wants. Your brain's been triggered uh, by something that you might not even be aware of, a sight, a sound, a smell, a, you know, a kid, a phrase, something at work. And then you immediately go to this negative place. So what happens? A lot of times people say, holy cow, what is wrong with me? I mean, I set out today to have nothing but positive thoughts. And here's a negative thought. I must be broken. No, you're not broken. You're human. You're, you're having the thoughts and emotions and feelings you have because you are human. Um, there's nothing wrong with these thoughts that pop into your head on, on, in the surface. Because, again, your brain is just kind of doing whatever it wants. The key is what do you do with these thoughts? You know, this is why the concepts of things like mindfulness. This is why... Um, you know, working toward uh, something that you, you really enjoy or appreciate or something that's true to your values is so important because when you're doing that, you're still going to have these negative thoughts pop up and it's going to be a lot easier to just kind of jump into the present moment. So eventually, you will start to work pretty hard um, to see the, the good or the positive. The negative stuff will still try to catch you, hook you. You know, the, they call it cognitive fusion. Your negative thoughts are still going to say, wait, I'm over here. You know, remember, we used to be afraid of that because your brain is really looking for this path of least resistance. And I think that's one of the concepts that uh, once you can kind of recognize this, there's nothing wrong with what you are going through. There's nothing wrong with the thoughts or emotions or feelings that you're having. Um, here's an overused example, but I think it just illustrates it so well uh, when you maybe have listened to somebody talk about running a marathon. Maybe you've been in a, uh, a church a congregation or a motivational speaker has come to your area and they talk about the time where they trained for a marathon and it was incredible and they went and ran the Boston Marathon and it changed their life. And you're, you're sitting in the crowd, maybe you've never ran a day in your life, maybe you used to be a runner, maybe you're a 5K runner, and you hear this story and you get motivated because this person motivates you. This person is a motivational speaker, a life coach, maybe even somebody uh, uh, like myself and they're just getting the crowd worked up into a frenzy and everybody thinks, I can do that. I, yeah, yeah, I'm going to run a marathon. 
and the brain acts reacts accordingly. It sends a little bit of dopamine to the reward center, and it feels good. You feel really good. But if you step back, take a look at what happens next. Remember, bless your brain's heart, but your brain is it doesn't know what it's like to go train for a marathon, and it worries that you are going to expend an awful lot of electrical activity for no reward or no gain. So your brain is going to say, after this little dopamine bump, it's going to say, yeah, but you never ran a marathon before and you don't really have a training plan and you don't really have shoes or um, what were you to even start or, you know, I don't know, maybe if there aren't other runners in your family, they're going to make fun of you and maybe you can't afford the marathon fee. Maybe you, uh, all the marathons are in your area or on days that you're not available. So your brain, again, is trying to hook you to what we call these stories then if your brain can hook you to one of these stories, then guess what? You don't really have to go run the marathon, do you? And then your brain gets to say, oh, okay, crisis averted. We didn't know how that was going to turn out, but we know what we know now. We know what uh, this person's going through right now. Even if it doesn't seem like the best situation, at least it's not uh, going to have them out there trying to run a marathon, maybe having a heart attack, maybe getting hit by the side of the road, maybe embarrassing themselves, maybe not being able to succeed. So your brain is trying to just go for the path of least resistance. So um, eventually... You, you learn to defuse from these thoughts, these ones that aren't very productive or aren't very helpful toward your goal. And especially if one of these goals is based on one of your values, you know, in this uh, A Liberated Mind, this book by Dr. Stephen Hayes, please go listen to the episode I did a couple of weeks ago about this uh, book, A Liberated Mind, where he talks about values or these, uh, these, these things of being and doing. You know, if I am going to do things that are going to make me uh, more healthy, if I'm going to be a person who is reliable, if I'm going to be a person now who goes after things in their life that uh, are important to them, these are those values that you're going to have. You know, values of adventure, values of authenticity, values of connection, or I'm going to be a good parent, I'm going to be a good friend. When we start to kind of work more toward our values, and he makes a great point, values are between you and the person in the mirror. I mean, that's really the, the only person that you uh, are ultimately accountable for um, or accountable to is that person in the mirror. Let me kind of go and read that one from, uh, from a liberated mind. He says that values, people often attempt to achieve goals because they feel that they have to. Otherwise, people that we care about or whose views we care about would be displeased or they'll be disappointed in themselves. But research shows that such socially compliant goals, I love that he calls them that, Such socially compliant goals give rise to motivation that's weak and ineffective. We might try to drive our own behavior with such external goals, but we also secretly resent them because they undermine our own process of unfolding. Listen to that, right? If we're trying to do something because we feel like we're supposed to, or like if we don't do it, it's going to let somebody else down, we may try and try as much as we can, and we're trying to drive our behavior with these external goals, but we secretly resent them because they undermine our own process of unfolding. He says the yearning for self-direction and purpose cannot be fully met by goal achievement since that is always either in the future, meaning I haven't met my goal, or it's in the past. I met my goal. How many times have you met a goal? Even like weight loss goals, things like that. If the goal is just to lose 10 pounds and you lose the 10 pounds, you kind of feel good for a little bit, but then it's like, but now what? But if if your goal or if you're going to live by a value, if a value is uh, being and doing, let me kind of get to that part and I'll circle back around to my point. He says, values are chosen qualities of being and doing, such as being a a good parent, being a dependable friend, being socially aware, being loyal, being honest, being courageous. Um, It might be of doing, of of eating better. It might be being a person who thinks about what they eat. You know, what what are your values? says, living in accordance with your values is never finished. It's a lifelong journey, and it provides a way to create enduring sources of motivation based on meaning. Ultimately, what your values are is up to you. They're a matter between you and the person in the mirror. So if you have a goal of your kids making it through college or your kids uh, going to a certain college, if that's your goal, you know, great. You can force them to get there. You can, you can shame them. You can guilt them. You can do all the work to get them there. And then when they get there, you know, you, what's now what? But if, you're, if your value is being a caring parent or being a dependable parent or being that parent that they can always turn to, that is something that's never finished. So that, that one's going to feel satisfying whether they go to the college you want them to go to or where they go to the college they want to go to or where they go to college at all. If you've got this relationship that you're building with them on based on your values, it feels amazing. It feels liberating. So definitely the goal there is to live by your values. Okay, um, let's kind of, uh, I think we're getting to the, we're wrapping this thing up. So here are a few steps to retrain your brain. 
The first one that they talk about is being grateful. Find something to be grateful for every day. And I'm going to be super honest with you on this one. I even did a grateful episode a long time ago on the podcast, and I had all the data and the science and the research there, and it is there. It is, it is there big time. Then I was even asked to do a corporate consulting gig, and I was so excited. I thought, okay, what's the topic? And it was gratitude. And I spent 45 to 50 minutes um, talking to executives at a very large corporation about gratitude, about being grateful. Here's, here's the way this works. And I, and I can, on, can honestly say that this is something that I have tried to uh, employ in my daily life. So find something to be grateful for every day. If you keep a journal, write down three things that you're grateful for every morning. And if you can, every night. But, and here's, you can maybe even think, you can see where we're going. Even if your goal is, you know, if you're just trying to write these things down, that you are going to start to look for things to be grateful for. You're just going to be more aware. And guess what? You're going to be more present. Trying to look at things to be grateful for in the here and now keeps you away from that. Yeah, but in the past, it's like, okay, well, noted. But uh, I'm looking for things to be grateful for now. Or, but what about in the future? You know, it's like, okay, fair enough. But uh, again, I need to kind of get myself looking at things to be grateful for now. So they say if you start to feel anxious or pessimistic, pause a minute and, uh, and write them down again. If it's too hard, write down five or even ten new things you're grateful for, and by the end of the exercise, you'll feel much happier and fulfilled. So there's one of the steps they suggest on retraining your brain. Be grateful. Uh, Gratitude journal. The second one says catch yourself. They say don't wait for your friends or family to tell you you're complaining. Pay attention to your thoughts and words. If you're complaining, quickly shift your energy to find solutions and lessons to be learned. Afterwards, treat yourself yourself to a nice cup of tea for the effort if you are a tea uh, person who enjoys that. So catch yourself. And a uh, little personal story here that, uh, that I feel like is something I would love to share. So don't wait for your friends or family to tell you you're complaining. Pay attention to your thoughts and words. Now, there was a time where I, I think I was in my head a lot. I think it was well before um, when I was kind of getting uh, my, my practice going. I um, had a, a business that I'd been involved in that had not been doing very well. It was, I was starting to lean more toward therapy. And I was starting to work a lot in the world of mindfulness, trying to be far more present, but really struggling with that. And I am a positive guy. I mean, I can I can admit that, but uh, I just felt like things were kind of heavy. That there was just a lot of a lot of stuff going on. And I remember going to my wife at one point, and she's always been such a safe place to go and process and talk to. And she had let me know that I didn't quite seem like that guy that I had always been, the guy that came home and that uh, everybody was pretty excited. To see, um, or that, uh, and I, I, she's probably she probably would take exception to me telling this story in that way, um, because I, I think maybe on the outside I was manifesting it to not necessarily appear to be this dramatic. I think it was this dramatic in my head, but she just said she just you know was was I able to get back to that person, that positive person who comes in and is just excited that everybody kind of feeds off of. And I thought, man, that's me. You know, there's my value. That's my my sense of being and doing. That's the person I want to be. And so I remember um, it, it was a little bit of a process. It was some daily mindfulness that I was continuing to do. I love this Headspace app and being able to just recognize those thoughts. And, and then what I love about this uh, part of calling catch yourself of, yeah, my wife had told me to maybe pay more attention, but I started recognizing a lot of the, the behaviors or the stories that I was telling myself. And a lot of them were me um, working a lot, working hard. You know, I, I had not necessarily worked uh, that much at that point in my life. <laughs> Sounds like I was a total slacker. I always worked a lot, but I mean, this was one where I was trying to build this new practice and also close down some other uh, opportunities that were still requiring a lot of effort. So I, I think I was coming home a lot of times and just carrying that, hey, I want everybody to feel sorry for me. I want everybody to go, man, dad, I don't know how you do it. And uh, that just changed my whole life to have that awareness to be able to catch my own thoughts and my own feelings and my own actions and words. And I found that a lot of times on that drive home, where I would normally just listen to a podcast or listen to an audio book, and I would kind of get lost in my head a little bit, I would come home, I might be dragging my feet a tiny bit, wanting people to go, whoa, dad, how are you doing? I don't know how you do it. And I just thought, that is not the person that I want to be. And so on the way home, I remember one particular time, and, and I would often when I would pull into the driveway, I'm like, it's go time. You know, let's do this. Open the door and dad is home. You know, dog's excited, kid's excited, wife's excited. And if they're not, I'm excited. And uh, over time, that started to become the pattern to the point of where I'm pulling up into my driveway and I can't wait. You know, it's uh, I got to darn near unbuckling the seatbelt and hitting the garage door before it's even within range because it's go time. And I remember after a, a one particular, it had been a, a little bit of a rough day. We'll just call it that. There have been a couple of client uh, situations that had been pretty intense 
and I found myself driving home and I was, I was kind of feeling a little bit uh, down and I just found myself kind of thinking that same thing of just, you know, or what, what am I, what am I thinking here? What am I doing? And it's like normal to have those thoughts and emotions. Fine. But man, this is my time to energize. This is my time to connect with family, you know, to really dial into these values. And I found that I was, I was almost close to just uh, pulling into the driveway and, and kind of just walking in again, wanting everybody to feel sorry for me. And it was just this uh, magical, you know, kind of liberating thing where I caught myself and, uh, and, I, and I shifted my energy there. You know, it said they, they say, shift your energy to find solutions and lessons to be learned. The lesson learned was I was kind of falling back on that. Um, I wanted everybody to feel sorry for me story. And uh, that is not a productive thought that goes along with my own values. So I came in there and, um, man, I, I just I, I, I was on fire again. And before I knew it, I wasn't really thinking much about the stresses of the day, that sort of thing. And later that night, I, I was able to process with my wife and say, and that was a little bit of a choice. That was a decision to walk in the door and not to, you know, say, I can't believe I'm thinking these things. It's like, well, I'm human. I was thinking those things because I'd had a little bit of a rough day. But uh, those were not productive thoughts. They weren't workable thoughts toward my value based goal of connection, connection with the family, um, just kind of making the most out of that moment, being present there at home. And uh, so that was a real turning point for me. That really was. I feel like I think of that often now if I'm driving home, if I've had a rough day, those sort of things, of being able to just note those feelings and emotions, set them aside. You know, I can't just deny them. I can't uh, beat myself up for them. I can't even try to do a little thought suppression and say, don't think those. It's like they're there. I'm human. But I'm going to focus my, sh- my, my energy, my you know, shift toward what is really important to me, and that is this connection with family. All right, a couple more things that he talks about. Change your mood. He says, even if you feel overwhelmed and negative, Remove yourself from whatever you're doing. Shift your state of mind. If you're home, sit down with your favorite book and cook up a tasty treat. If you're at work, go to the washroom or break room for a few minutes and listen to your favorite song. Breathe deeply. Close your eyes. Pay attention to every word. Hold on to that relaxing feeling and carry it with you throughout the day. So much good in just this one thing of change your mood. This goes so along with uh, my concept, what I like to call the emotional baseline. You, when you're feeling overwhelmed, when you have all these things going on in your life, as I always say, you're you're baseline of emotions is low, but you're still being met with all the same challenges and and questions and things that you have to deal with on a daily basis. You are going to respond differently if your baseline of emotions are low or if your baseline of emotions are high. So whenever you do feel like you're overwhelmed or flooded with emotions or you feel like you're not being very productive, then don't just sit in there and try to just power through. If you need to step out and go for a walk or, you know, like he says, sit down with your favorite book, cook up a tasty treat, um, just take a, take a break for a minute and, and listen to your favorite song or better yet, where he talks about breathe deeply, close your eyes, pay attention to every word. That is mindfulness, my friends. You know, oftentimes it does help to go outside, get some fresh air, just listen, listen and note and identify the sounds around you, the smells around you. Um, pay attention to your feet on the, on the ground, pay attention to your breathing. Just don't, you know, find if you find yourself starting to ruminate or think about the woe is me stories or the what did that guy shouldn't have said this stories or I can't believe they did this or what if this happens in the future, just don't beat yourself up once you kind of recognize that. Okay, noted. And now I'm just going to, I'm going to count, you know, I do this one often. I count in through my nose. I count one out through my mouth. I count two in through my nose. I count three out through my mouth. I count four. Try to get to 10. Just try it. And you'll find your mind just starts wandering like crazy. When you recognize, okay, I'm not even doing the exercise anymore, start back at one. And, uh, and you'll, you'll, get, uh, you'll get to the point where you'll get pretty good at getting to 10. So he talks about changing your mood. The last one he says, I, and I hadn't heard this term, but I like it, practice wise effort. Wise effort is the practice of letting go of anything that doesn't serve you. If your worry won't improve your situation or teach you a lesson, simply let it go and move on. And I know it sounds easier than, uh, than it really is, right? Oh, actually, the next paragraph he says, this is much easier said than done, of course, but if you write it out, ask friends for advice, take some time to think about it constructively, it really can be done. And, and what I say to this one is, practice it, the practice of letting go of anything that doesn't serve you is this concept of mindfulness. And uh, I did an episode on this a little while ago. I'd highly encourage you to go look that one up too. But it is learning how to, you know, your thoughts are going, they're ruminating, you're thinking about the past, the future, the, you know, whatever your thoughts are doing, just as soon as you recognize that, just noted. I love that concept, that phrase. Noted. All right. That's a, there's a thought. There's a, there it is. I see where it's going. Not going to beat myself up about it. And uh, I'm going to kind of come right back to focus. I'm going to come right back to the present. And my brain might start thinking something else as well. And then it's like, all right, there it goes again. No problem. I'm going to come right back to the center. And, and here's the deal. Do that enough. And, it, and we're not talking, you know, you do it for 10 minutes one day and then all of a sudden you change your neuropathways. Now, unfortunately, it takes a little bit of time. It can take a few weeks. It can take, 
you know, some really intentional practice. But the more you do it, you literally are changing the neuropathways of the brain. That's our entire goal. Because what eventually happens, and I, and I really, I promise you, testify to you, um, whatever the right phrase is to say right now, that the more that you do this, this mindfulness concept, this being able to focus on something grateful, to being able to catch yourself and pay attention to your thoughts and words, the, the ability to uh, raise your emotional baseline and catch your mood, and I like this concept of practicing wise effort, of letting in, go of anything that doesn't serve you, the more you do that, the more it becomes those deeply dug in neural pathways that hit that habit center, that basal ganglia. And that that doesn't mean that you will never have another negative thought again. On the contrary, you're going to have them. Everybody does. But your brain almost reflexively sees it, notes it, and then kind of lets it go. And you move back to being present and center. And just imagine. Imagine if that becomes the default of your brain. Even if you start started this uh, whole journey or this process as someone who is overly anxious, someone who is venting, complaining, that sort of thing, and you start to take these steps on a day-by-day day day basis – and even when those negative thoughts get too much or when you find yourself that starting to think that maybe this is not working, again, those are the stories your brain's trying to hook you to because your brain wants that path of least resistance. But I promise you, when you do this for weeks, months, and it becomes really the pattern, then you you will reflexively deal with these negative thoughts or emotions or feelings. You have them. You note them. They, aren't, they don't serve you very well, and you just keep moving forward. There might be days where they're a little bit more intense than others because there's a lot of triggers. Maybe you aren't getting enough sleep. Maybe something significant happened. Someone passed away. Maybe you lost a job. And then you can now you can even see that it's like, okay, note it. I mean, of course I'm going to feel this way because I'm human, but, uh, but I'm going to continue to learn how to be present and work toward those value-based goals. I could go on and on and on, but I hope that you picked up something today um, that uh, how complaining physically rewires your brain to be anxious and depressed And here are some solutions on how you can overcome that. All right, folks, thanks for taking the time. i got a lot of good episodes coming up, some good interviews that are scheduled on the books. Just a lot of exciting things coming on the Virtual Couch Podcast. So make sure you hit that subscribe button. And uh, can't wait to see you next time on the Virtual Couch. Compressed emotions flying past Our heads and out the other end The pressures of the daily grind is wonderful Elastic waste and rubber ghost I'm floating past the midnight hour They push aside the things that matter most It's wonderful I have to wonder Which ghost is mine He eats my ponder And somehow saves up all my time The screen is my blind They tip all my senses A million opportunities The chance is yours to take or lose It's wonderful Fun's always on the back burner Until the inopportune time You're always pushed to go farther Shut up, it's wonderful I have this wonder Which goes of mine He eats my thunder Explode, allow the understanding through.